Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 181, White's Case for the Trinity, Part 1. I had a chance recently to view a recent debate on YouTube. This debate was held on April 21st, 2017, and it was hosted by South Dakota Apologetics. The debaters were Dr. James White and a minister named Joe Ventilacion, and he was representing the Iglesia Ni Cristo denomination, which is mostly in the Philippines. I don't know a lot about that group, other than that it's a restorationist type of Unitarian denomination. I think they have some strong sectarian tendencies that I probably would disagree with, but we would probably have a lot of things in common as concerns our understanding of biblical doctrines about God and Jesus. The thing that really struck me about this particular debate was that Dr. White seemed bored and annoyed at having to argue about this. I think maybe his real interests are elsewhere these days, and he doesn't really want to have to come back to this. He thinks the Trinity is really obvious stuff and that only kooks deny it. He doesn't get irritated as the debate goes on. He starts off irritated. I think he is bored. He's been making pretty much the same case for more than two decades now. His basic strategy is to deduce the Trinity from a handful of favorite texts, of course, read in a creedally Trinitarian way, and then to aggressively accuse his opponent of merely assuming Unitarian theology whenever the opponent appeals to any New Testament text. In truth, it's not a very fun game. And the debates need not go that way. Of course, when any Christian comes to a text of the Bible, they are going to have in the back of their mind other things they think the Bible says. And they're going to read the text in light of their commitments. With effort, of course, you can get yourself into the other person's head and you can understand their point of view. I don't think that Dr. White has done this very well. He doesn't seem to feel the force of the other side. I think he just doesn't get it in most cases. He doesn't seem to be very familiar with Unitarian exegesis, past or present. And also, from what he says, there's no evidence that he studied and benefited from important work on the Trinity by analytic theologians in the last three decades or so. Analytic theologians are theologians who are typically philosophy professors who have been trained in philosophy. And these are mostly evangelicals and mostly Trinitarians. They've worked out some different ways of trying to show that the Trinity is consistent. And I think some of them do show that, although not all Trinitarians are going to accept those interpretations. What these serious intellectuals do is they go beyond just the formulas, and they try to spell out what the formulas actually mean. They try to give interpretations which are plausibly thought to be coherent, and which arguably fit other things that Christians want to say. This work's been going on a long time, and it's easily accessible. There's my entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. There's an entry by Dr. Daniel Howard Snyder, a leading Christian philosopher, which is in the Routledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy, by Dr. Harriet Baber in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So there's an easy entry into this material, not that it's the easiest reading once you really get into it. I'll have links for all of these sources on the blog post for this episode. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through Dr. White's opening statement. And as I'll show, there's a great mismatch between Dr. White's confidence and the strength of his case. Also, I think you'll see that he really pays a price for not paying attention to the analytic literature. He hardly takes a step to show that the Trinity is coherent, that is, self-consistent. Well, good evening. It is an honor to be with you this evening. We have a lot to talk about, however, so we're going to dive right in, skip over some of the niceties, and get to the issue this evening on the doctrine of the Trinity. Let's go to the heart of the issue. Now, let's be honest with ourselves. All Orthodox Christians are monotheists. We all believe there is only one true God. I stand before you as a person who has debated Mormons in Salt Lake City many times defending the fact that there is only one true God. Trinitarians are not 
polytheists. We do not believe in many gods. I do not believe in many gods as a Trinitarian. So proving that there is only one true God in this debate is to demonstrate that you have no idea what the real issues are. Because that's not the subject this evening. We're not debating whether we are monotheists. We're all monotheists. Tonight we have two kinds of monotheism being presented this evening. You have Unitarian monotheism, where the one being of God is shared by only one person. So Unitarianism is the idea that you have one God, one being of God, and only one person sharing that being. Let me just interrupt briefly here. This is an unclear definition of Unitarianism. Unitarianism is a theology which identifies, strictly identifies, that is, asserts the numerical identity of the one God with the Father only. In contrast, a Trinitarian identifies the one God with the Trinity. You really need to make the distinction in terms of numerical identity. Which thing is it which is identical to Yahweh? Is it the Father or is it the Trinity? That's how you distinguish Unitarian from Trinitarian. Here then is his definition of Trinitarian. Trinitarian monotheism, where the one being of God is shared by three persons. We clearly differentiate between being and person. Being is what makes someone what they are. Person is what makes someone who they are. These are two distinct concepts. Dr. White is surely correct that a Trinitarian is by definition a monotheist. The thesis that there's only one God is just part of any Trinity theory. The one God is supposed to be the Trinity. Okay, but it doesn't follow that polytheism is totally irrelevant to this discussion. Because you can be a monotheist and a polytheist. You can just commit to inconsistent things. And the way you do that with the Trinity, you say the Father is divine, the Son is divine, and the Spirit is divine, and none of those are identical to one another. There are three different ones, three different beings. Okay, then you have three divine beings, which means the same thing as three gods. Now, if you turn around and say, yeah, but I say there's only one God, fine, you're a monotheist, but you're not a consistent monotheist. You hold to a position that explicitly says monotheism and clearly, implicitly asserts polytheism. So polytheism is not really irrelevant to this. It never has been irrelevant, and this concern goes all the way back to the Nicene Creed of the year 325. That creed calls the Father and Son God from God, true God from true God. It's pretty clear there are two different beings there which are being called God and true God, and it doesn't say that they're the same God. I think that's implied in the 381 version, but not in the 325 version. So there are multiple beings that you're calling God, multiple beings you're calling true God. Clearly, they're not the same being because there are differences between them, even in that creed. So yeah, polytheism has really always been an issue, even before you have the fully developed theology of a tripersonal being, which only comes towards the end of the 300s. Now, he's characterized the Trinity as the view that the being of God is shared by three different persons. Being of God. Being can mean an individual, or it can mean a universal property. Only a universal property could be shared in principle. A particular property can't be shared. And it's hard to see what it would mean to say that an individual is shared by others. So he says the being of God is shared by three. I take it he means divinity is shared by three. Three persons. Okay, let's hear how he continues. Now, if, therefore, the Bible reveals that there are three persons who are described as sharing the one divine being, the debate must be concluded in favor of Trinitarianism. So if three different persons share one divine being, and this one divine being is the property divinity, then he counts that as a victory. But if three different things share that property, it looks like you've got three different gods. Again, it's too quick to say that polytheism is not an issue. But also, he hasn't said enough to make clear what should count as a victory for the Trinity side. What are these persons? If they just turn out to be something like personalities or modes, and then the shared divine being is just the individual god, 
You're just saying that the one individual God lives in three different ways. Well, that's just what a oneness Pentecostal could say, right? So why should that count as a victory for a Trinitarian? Trinitarians believe the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have taken different roles in creation and redemption. Right. So if they've taken different roles, there are different things that are true about them, and they really are three. We're not just talking about one thing three times here. We're talking about three different things, if indeed they've carried out three different roles. Or, back to the oneness Pentecostal interpretation, are we really talking about one self and then three just sort of personalities or modes of operating or something like that? Again, it's not clear that is good Trinitarianism. Therefore, proving that there are differences between the persons is irrelevant to this debate. We recognize the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. Therefore, differentiating between them means nothing if you're actually arguing against the doctrine of the Trinity. There are three what's now, Dr. White. If there are three beings, and yet each one is divine, you've got three divine beings. If you want to say there are three somethings, you need to tell us what sort of something that is. Personality? Mode? You tell us. For all you've bothered to say, again, you've left on the table what looks like a oneness Pentecostal interpretation. So let's not waste our time with straw man argumentation. Amen to that. You cannot simply assume Unitarianism and then read it into the text of the Bible. You must prove Unitarianism in the same way I must prove Trinitarianism. Well, that seems fair enough. Unitarians should have to prove that the New Testament assumes Unitarian theology, and the Trinitarians should have to prove that the New Testament assumes Trinitarian theology. You can't just assume it and say, well, it says God, therefore that must be the end of the debate. For example, John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus addresses the Father as the only true God. This is irrelevant to our debate unless you assume Unitarianism. What was Jesus supposed to say? You're one of many gods? We're all monotheists. Jesus isn't going to talk to the Father as if he's one of many gods. Uh, this is depressingly confused. You don't have to assume Unitarianism to read the text in the way that he's talking about. You know how we know this? Because Augustine read it that way. In a couple of different places in his writings, Augustine looks at this and says, hmm, Jesus says the Father is the only true God. That can't be right. The Arians must have gotten to this. The Arians must have corrupted this text somehow. He reasons that if the Father is the only true God, then no one else is. He speculates that it must really read, Father and Son are the only true God, or Father, Son, and Spirit are the only true God. But of course, that's not what it says. So what Augustine gets about this, and I'm going to assume that Dr. White is a fan of Augustine to some extent because he's a Reformed fellow. What Augustine sees there is that there's quantification going on. It's not just description. To read it as just description would be to read it as Jesus ascribing this property to the Father. One true God. But that's not how we naturally read it. If you say Trump is the one true president, that implies that no one else is president. Truly so. You're not just describing Trump as one true president and then leaving it as an open question whether there are any others who are also one true president. He's not getting the logical structure of the passage. If you actually want to see this explained in terms of modern logic, I'll have a link on the blog post for this episode where I spell it out and go through what the misunderstanding is. But again, you don't have to be Unitarian to read it that way. You just have to be an English speaker or a Greek speaker or a Latin speaker, etc. Only has to do with quantification. What Jesus is assuming there is that for anything whatever, either it's the Father or it's not true God, because the Father is the one true God. So what Dr. White does now is he reaches a little bit farther into the passage to pull out something that's really not relevant either to the Trinity or to the deity of Christ, but uh, he thinks it is because he reads it as involving preexistence. 
In John 17, 3, Jesus makes eternal life dependent upon joint knowledge of the Father and the Son, and then goes on within one sentence to say, And now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had in your presence before the world came to be. That's not a plan speaking, my friends. Plans do not use personal pronouns. Okay, but... That's a silly point. Nobody thinks that Jesus, when he's saying this, is a plan. This is a divine person speaking to another divine person about a time in eternity past when the two shared eternal glory. That's within one sentence of John 17, 3. So let's not invest time on proving things that are not in dispute. The issue is Trinitarianism versus Unitarianism. Right, so he wants to read Jesus' reference there to the glory he had with the Father before the creation of the world. He wants to read that as a memory, like Jesus is remembering this. But of course, there's nothing about the text that forces you to take it that way. And in fact, it's a common Hebrew idiom to talk about things that are predestined as if they always were with God. So, for instance, Revelation 13, 8, they mention the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Well, of course, he wasn't slain back then. But even back then, he was destined to be slain as a sacrifice for sin. And so, it's described as always having been, or at least as having been in the ancient past. This is a common Jewish way of describing predestined, important events and things. It's all explained very thoroughly, by the way, in Trinity's podcasts number 61 and 62 by Dr. Dustin Smith. Now, two absolutely necessary foundational starting points this evening that will determine how you listen to this debate. I believe in sola scriptura. Scripture is the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. I do not accept any other quote-unquote revelations from God. But I also believe in tota scriptura. We must believe all that the scripture teaches We cannot pick and choose. We must harmonize our beliefs with all of God's revelation because all of it has been given to us by the Spirit of God. Sola Scriptura, Tota Scriptura, hold both of us to those standards this evening. Perhaps the members of the Iglesia Ni Cristo do believe in some other prophetic uh, revelation, but I don't think that really pertains to the subject matter of this debate. So, I think he's just burning his opening statement time here. I guess this is just red meat for the Reformed people present? I don't know. His opponent's not Catholic or Orthodox. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. White switches the subject. Now, strangely, he's going to change topics. He's going to stop talking about the Trinity, and he's going to move over to the deity of Christ. He thinks this is relevant, but let's see how. For Christians down through the ages, there really hasn't been any question about this. There is no question the New Testament describes Jesus as the os, as God. In Titus 2.13 and 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is called our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, using what's known as the Granville Sharp construction, in those texts. In Romans 9, 5, we have referring to Christ, who is overall the eternally blessed God. Okay, so what is Dr. White doing here? I thought we were talking about the Trinity. Why then are we talking about passages in which Jesus is called Theos? Dr. White seems to not register that most Unitarians will agree that there are some passages in which Jesus is referred to as Theos. Does it follow that he's God himself? No, because beings other than God can be referred to occasionally as theos. It seems that Dr. White is here assuming something that his opponents should all deny, and that is that if some being is truly, is properly referred to as God or as a God or addressed as God, that can only be because that being is God or has the divine essence or something like that. 
the problem with that is that there are scriptural counterexamples to it. What he's doing here is a really questionable debate strategy, which is just machine gunning out clearly disputable verses. Is he assuming that he's dealing with a low information audience or with an informed audience? Because an informed audience is going to know, or at least quickly look up and see, that all three of those translations he just offered are controversial. They depend on difficult points of grammar and punctuation in the Greek text. So Titus 2.13, his preferred translation has Jesus being called our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Of course, the New American Standard Version reads it differently. It says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, comma, Jesus Christ. On this rendering of the Greek grammar, the glory is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the glory of our great God, which in the New Testament is the Father. He's hoping you're not going to look in the footnote of your translation or in your study Bible. He's just going to slam this down as a proof text. Again, 2 Peter 1.1. He quotes it as calling Jesus our God and Savior. And the New Revised Standard Version does say, to those who have received a faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, but it puts a footnote with an alternate translation, which says, or the righteousness of our God and the Savior Jesus Christ. And countless readers have noticed verse 2, which comes immediately after, May grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So they're referred to as two beings there. That's a reason to go with the alternate translation. White's not going to tell you that. He's on a controversial translation spree. Romans 9.5 Now if you're a Greek scholar, you could write a dissertation about this or a long article. But all a lay Christian has to do is look into modern translation Dr. White tells us that Romans 9.5 refers to Christ as who is over all the eternally blessed God. So it sounds like it's calling Christ God. New Revised Standard Translation says, To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all God-blessed forever. Hmm, sounds like that's not calling Jesus God. And then there are two alternate translations in the footnote, which tells you that this is a difficult to translate verse. One alternate translation is, comes from the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever. That's the one that Dr. White wants. Or another translation, according to the flesh comes the Messiah, period. May he who is God over all be blessed forever. So if you punctuate differently, then we're into a new sentence and it ends up praising God because of what Jesus has done. So it would shift from talking about the Messiah to the God whose Messiah he is. These are all grammatically possible. Really, this is the best we can do? It's not even clear why it matters that Jesus is called God, because beings other than God can be called God. Why not the Son of God? And then we throw down three difficult-to-translate, difficult-to-read verses. That's weak. Now he thinks he's got the fatal shot here in John 20, 28. Let's hear him out on that. In John 20, 28, Thomas specifically says to the Lord Jesus, My Lord and my God, both words being applied to Jesus. And Jesus accepts these words and in fact blesses them as a statement of faith. If Jesus was merely a man, he should have immediately rebuked Thomas and said, Never say something like that to me. I am not your Lord and your God. He accepts Thomas's statement. Yet another contestable interpretation thrust out there. For one thing, he just asserts that it would be inappropriate, maybe even blasphemy, if a mere man were worshipped or honored as Lord. Well, that's just the very thing that his Unitarian opponents are going to deny, so he's just not connecting here. Our view is that the raised and exalted human Messiah can and must be worshipped because that's God's will. It's not self-evident that it's wrong for us to worship the risen human Lord, as Paul says, to the glory of God. But now let's go back to that passage and consider carefully its interpretation. In the New Testament, after the resurrection, Christians confess one God, who is the Father, 
and they also confess one Lord. That's Jesus. You see this famously in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It may well be here that Thomas is falling down to worship the risen Lord, the one Lord, and also the one God. Now, why would you take it that way in the context? There's quite a lot in this book about how it's God who's working through Jesus. And so he would then be acknowledging that God really is with him. God really has been working through him. And now God has vindicated him. So he says, my Lord, that's Jesus, and my God, that's the Father. How do I know that? Because of the other things that John says, specifically in chapter 17 and in chapter 20. Dr. White's not good with the gospel according to John. He just flat overlooks the constant distinctions it makes between Jesus and God. If it's distinguishing Jesus from God, it can't also be identifying Jesus with God unless the author is just stupidly confused. But of course, he's not stupidly confused. All of the passages that people misread as identifying Jesus with God can be taken in other ways. Non-arbitrary, first-century, well-motivated ways that fit the context of the rest of the book. What Dr. White is doing here is he's cherry-picking some long favorite verses to try to show that John is saying that Jesus is God himself. In John 1.1, we're told that the Logos, the Word, eternally existed in 1-1-A, that He eternally existed in personal relationship with the Father in 1-1-B, and that as to His nature, He is deity. Existed in personal relationship with. Right, this is His gloss on one word, which is translated as with. That's one way to take it. Another way to take it is that the word is with God in the way that wisdom in Proverbs 8 is with God. Not an additional divine person, really just an attribute, although a personified attribute. I'm not going to make the full argument here, but there's a very strong case to be made that the logos, the word here, is not supposed to be the pre-human Jesus. But he's just going to assume that. I guess it's a crowd pleaser. Likewise, John tells us that Jesus is the ego I me, the I am, in John 8, 24, 8, 58, 13, 19, and 18, 5 through 6. Wow, John says that Jesus is the I am? Dang, that sounds like he thinks that Jesus is just God himself. So he's reading this as Jesus saying that you'll die in your sins unless you believe that I am God himself? Where have I heard this interpretation before? Oh yeah, Oneness Pentecostals, such as in this hit song on YouTube. But Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus Trinity Schminty by Winter Band. They think Jesus is the Father. Jesus is God. The Father is God. So it follows that Jesus is the Father. They're oneness. I don't recommend you take your exegesis or your taste in rock music from Oneness Pentecostals. Oneness Pentecostals believe in the deity of Christ, seemingly in the same sense that James White does. They just identify them. Jesus is God himself. Later in the debate, Dr. White says that God won't give glory to another but only to himself. So if God gives glory to Jesus, that must be because Jesus is God himself. Okay, well then the Father is, the Son is God. You can just interchange all of those. They're co-referring terms. 
if that's his view, it's not clear that that's Orthodox Trinitarianism. It's also not clear that it's good exegesis of the fourth gospel. John 8, 24, the Revised Standard Version, Jesus says, I told you that you would die in your sins, for you will die in your sins, unless you believe that I am He. I am He. I am who? Now, footnote points out that the Greek just says, I am, but as we know from other passages in this book and from other parts of the Greek New Testament, ego a me can be idiomatic for I am he or I am the one who we're talking about, that sort of thing. So is the author of the book saying that your salvation depends on believing that Jesus is God himself, that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament? How about we look at the author's own thesis statement? This occurs at the end of the book, or what may have been the original ending, chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. You need to believe Jesus is saying that I am he. I am who? I am the Messiah. That's the whole point. Is he saying, hey, I'm God himself? No, he's saying I'm the Son of God. Of course, Dr. White is not the first person, and he won't be the last person, to misread the Gospel according to John as saying that Jesus is God himself. The first people to make this mistake are in John chapter 10. The Jews accuse Jesus of making himself God. What does he do? He said, "Up, oh, you're right. You got me. That is exactly what I'm saying. I'm glad you finally understand now. No. He corrects them. He says that he is God's son. I've got a blog post that discusses the argument that's going on in this passage. It's frequently misunderstood, but it's just right there. He points out that it's not blasphemy for him to say that he's God's son, because even people lesser than him were called gods by a higher title. So it just can't be blasphemous if Jesus, who's greater than these Old Testament people, is called by a lesser title, which is God's son. God's son is not God himself. John 8, 58, I'll skip over for now. There's a good discussion of this in Trinity's podcast 63. The gist of it is that a strong case can be made that in this passage, Jesus is saying that before Abraham existed, he was already in God's plan, the Messiah. Before Abraham was, I am he. John 18, 6, Jesus says, I am he, when they ask, is he Jesus of Nazareth? John 18, 5 and 6, they're about to arrest Jesus. He says, who are you looking for? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, ego, a me. Is he asserting, I am God himself? No. This is a case of that idiom of just self-identification. He's saying, yes, I am he. Who? Jesus of Nazareth. I am the one you're looking for. Now, when Jesus says, I am he, they step back and follow the ground. Either they're surprised, or they're surprised, and also there's some kind of manifestation of glory, like God's power coming out of him, as in, say, the transfiguration. It's not really clear, but they just go through this again. He says again that he is Jesus of Nazareth. That's the he which he is. It's just cherry-picking a sentence out of context to say that he's claiming, I am here. Does Dr. White think you're just not going to look it up? Jesus is worshipped in a religious context and is described as the creator of all things in John 1, 3, Colossians 1, 16 through 17, and Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. Here again, we're just using off-the-shelf arguments. He's not connecting with his debate opponent. His debate opponent, as becomes clear later in the debate, and which is just in standard materials about the Iglesia Ni Cristo, his debate opponent agrees that Jesus should be worshipped. Not because he's God, but because it's God's will that Jesus should be worshipped. It's God who exalted him and made him Lord. Now, this may please the evangelical audience, which assumes that it could only possibly be correct to worship God. But again, he's not connecting. In fact, there's a strong case to be made from the New Testament that Jesus should be worshipped, even though Jesus is not numerically identical to God. 
I lay out the case in a paper and in a video presentation of mine called Who Should Christians Worship? So you can see that. Again, how do we know that Jesus and God are not numerically identical? Because Jesus and God differ from one another. Whether you're a Trinitarian or a Unitarian, you have to agree with that. Now, did Jesus create the world? Let's suppose that he did. How is this relevant to the Trinity? Dr. White seems to not know that some Unitarians think that Jesus created the world. These are ones who believe in pre-existence, and they agree that the Logos is personally identical to the man Jesus. And this has included very famous Unitarians, such as Samuel Clark, the famous Anglican bishop, and John Biddle, the very famous English Unitarian. To assert that Jesus created or that God created through him is not to the point if it's the Trinity that we're talking about. We even possess a fragment of an early hymn of the church used by the Apostle Paul as a sermon illustration in his letter to the church at Philippi. There we read these words. You must have the same mindset among yourselves that was in Christ Jesus, who, although he eternally existed in the very form of God, did not consider that equality he had with God the Father something to be held on to at all costs, but instead he made himself nothing. Notice this is the divine person acting in eternity past. He made himself nothing at the incarnation by taking on the very form of a slave, by being made in human likeness, and having entered into human existence, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death one dies on a cross. Because of this, God the Father exalted him to the highest place and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So at the mention of the exalted name of Jesus, everyone who is in heaven, on earth, and under the earth bows the knee. By the way, that's a quotation from Isaiah 45 about Jehovah God. And every tongue confesses Jesus Christ is kurios, is Lord, all to the glory of God the Father. This is the faith of the Christian people and has been from the beginning. Not a lot to comment on there. A fairly standard evangelical reading of that text. The thing is, a strong case can be made that Jesus is being praised there for his humility and obedience in the course of his human life. You can take it as a case of Adam Christology, where unlike Adam, he doesn't grasp after equality with God, but rather he humbles himself, and therefore God has exalted him. A reading like this has been proposed by James Dunn. I've given my reasons in Trinity's podcast 48 and 49. Does this type of reading get addressed? Of course not. Okay, but let's grant him this common reading of Philippians 2, on which this is about the event of incarnation. It's about the pre-human Jesus becoming human. So what? Let's suppose that's completely right. So what? The Trinity doesn't follow. Of course, this reading is consistent with Trinity theories, but it's also consistent with the kind of Unitarianism that believes in the pre-existence of Jesus. So it's not really going to cut any ice in that debate. What about Dr. White's idea of the deity of Christ, where he just seems to think that the Bible teaches Jesus to be God himself? It doesn't help at all with that. And in fact, it hurts the cause of that deity of Christ claim. The whole passage is about Jesus's humble service to his God, for which God exalted him and rewarded him. And at the end of it, Yes, every knee is supposed to bow to Jesus, and it's striking that that's so. You maybe wouldn't have expected that before New Testament times. Everybody's supposed to bow the knee to Jesus, and this is referencing a passage in Isaiah, which has to do with Yahweh. But at the end of the passage, Paul tells us that this is all to the glory of God the Father. There's an idea here of indirect versus direct worship. If you directly worship the Son, you're indirectly worshiping the God who sent the Son. And so, Jesus isn't competing with God for glory. It glorifies God to worship Jesus. Aha, but isn't Paul signaling that Jesus is Yahweh himself? Because he's saying that this exaltation is a fulfillment of this ancient statement about every knee will bow to me, said by Yahweh. Well, this is a case of what I call the fulfillment fallacy. The New Testament authors will fairly often say that Jesus fulfills something that in ancient times was said about Yahweh or sometimes about someone else. But the reader is not supposed to infer that Jesus is Yahweh himself. And my reading of ancient Christian writers, the church fathers, 
I don't find that they're making this mistake. They're not thinking that Jesus is being identified with God just because he said to fulfill some passage that originally had to do with Yahweh. They believe in multiple fulfillments. The point, I think, is really easy to see when it's a non-Yahweh case. So, in Matthew 1, he says that Jesus' birth is a fulfillment of this prediction about a baby who will be born and his name will be Emmanuel. God is with us, or God with us. Now, if you go back and look in Isaiah 7, it's pretty clear that Emmanuel is a baby in Isaiah's time. In saying that Jesus is a fulfillment of this prediction, he's not saying that Jesus is that same being. He's not saying that Jesus is that baby. That would be saying that Jesus is like a reincarnation of this kid from Isaiah's time. No, Matthew's not saying that. Matthew thinks that there is another Christological fulfillment of that prediction, and the second fulfillment has to do with Christ. So, the fulfillment fallacy is saying that the one who fulfills a prophecy must be the same one as the prophecy was originally about. This is a naive mistake, and the only reason people make it is because they're eager to show that there's this secret encoded message in the New Testament that Jesus is really God himself. Of course, that's not its main explicit message at all. So, you have to really dig and try to find it being implied constantly. Okay, so in sum, a Unitarian can take this Philippians 2 passage in my way, or more in the traditional way, if they believe in the pre-existence of Christ. This is a primary passage, I think, which teaches that the exalted Jesus should be worshipped, and it reassures us that this is to the glory of God, the God who sent him, the God whose Messiah he is, the God who raised him from the dead, the God who exalted him to his right hand. There's more to argue about. You can say, well, what about the commandment that says only worship Yahweh? Well, that's a discussion for another time. I do address that in my presentation called, Who Should Christians Worship? So, I encourage you to check out that video or paper. So, where do we stand? Remember, the debate is whether God is a single self or is three selves, or whether God is one person or three persons. Has Dr. White made a case that God is a trinity, according to the New Testament? Not anywhere close. Now, we're only about halfway through his opening statement, so next week we'll see if he can make the sale. We'll see if he can make a connection, if he can get a grip on something that his Unitarian opponent would have to agree with, which actually implies that God is triune. So far, it's been pretty ineffective, but maybe he can pull it out. If you want to check out the entire debate, that's the first link on the blog post for this episode. Do go ahead and check that out. There are some interesting moments later in the debate. Next week, I'll continue my evaluation of his opening statement. Before we go, thank you, Sarah and Florida, for your donation through PayPal. Really appreciate it. And uh, it's also good to see your participation in the Facebook group. Also, we got a new review recently. This is in the iTunes store for the U.S., from a user named JB Pyro 7 They give us five stars. The tagline is excellent content. They say, I stumbled on this podcast in 2017 and have been devouring the backlog of fantastic content. Dale has introduced so many topics that I was dimly perceiving before and searching for people who had developed thoughts and systems to share. Dale's conversational style, charitable interactions, and search for the truth make this a valuable resource and a wonderfully enjoyable podcast. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Glad that it's been helpful. This week's thinking music has been Anxiety by Kai Engel. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at Trinity's dot org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.